Bone health and preventing fractures is important for everyone, especially people living with spinal cord injury. Today I'm at the Bone and Body Composition Lab at the University of Waterloo, where I'll be learning about bone density measurement and preventing fractures relating to osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a bone disease that is associated with low bone strength and an increased risk of fracture. There are a number of strategies that are used to prevent fractures. The first thing is to assess your risk. So we want to assess risk factors for bone loss or for fractures. And then if someone is thought to have some risk factors, they can be sent for a bone mineral density scan to assess their bone strength. The next is to recommend medication for people who are at increased risk of fractures. And there's a number of different types of medications that people can try and also to ensure that they're getting adequate calcium intake and adequate vitamin D. And finally, we also want to do exercise and fall prevention. So the number one cause of hospitalization in older adults is falls, and many falls cause fractures of the hip, of the spine, of the wrist. And so if we can prevent falls, we can prevent fractures. And one of the best ways to do that is with exercise. So exercise has been shown to prevent falls in older adults. Some types of exercise may also increase bone mineral density. So it can prevent fractures both by preventing falls and potentially having an impact on bone strength. With a spinal cord injury, there are additional risk factors for fractures that are slightly different than in people who do not have a spinal cord injury. So for example, having a motor complete injury or having tetraplegia or quadriplegia or being a woman who's over 50 and has been at least 10 years post-injury. Those are some examples of risk factors that are specific to people with spinal cord injury. There's also certain medications that are used more commonly in spinal cord injury that can increase the risk of fracture. So it's really important um, to talk to your doctor about your risk factors. Um, and also really important that we do some research to get the knowledge around those risk factors out there. With fractures, if you're admitted to hospital, then there's the risks associated with being in hospital for a long period of time, like being uh, sedentary or being uh, immobilized, so then you can have muscle atrophy, there's the risk of infection, there's the risk of uh, delirium for some older adults as well, and this can then cause functional deterioration and, and in some cases people can no longer live at home independently. So after hip fracture, um, uh, about 25% uh, can no longer go back, back home after having hip fracture because they can no longer live independently. To prevent fractures, we can do a number of things. So one is talking to your doctor about your risks and seeing if medication would be right for you, making sure you're getting adequate calcium and vitamin D and then making sure that you prevent falls or prevent the activities that could cause fractures. So for example, if you are being transferred, to making sure you're transferring in a way that your, your body and your legs are facing the same way and you're not twisting your legs. Well, if you have a person helping you transfer, making sure that they know how to transfer you safely, making sure that when you go through doorways that you're checking to make sure that your, your foot or other limbs are not going to get caught. And then um, if you are uh, ambulatory, if you're walking, um, to either use assistive device if you need one or work on your balance to make sure that you're stable when you're, when you're walking to prevent falls. Uh, there are a number of uh, exercises that can be used to challenge balance, to improve balance. Um, and even if you are not a person who walks, um, working on balance and sitting so that you're less likely to, to fall over or fall over your chair or using assistive devices like a seatbelt to prevent you from falling. Bone mineral density is measured with an x-ray machine called Dual Energy X-ray Absorptionometry. It's also referred to as DEXA, uh, D-X-A. You lie on a table and have an x-ray and they will sometimes x-ray your spine, they can x-ray your hip, and in people with spinal cord injury there's a specialized scan where they x-ray around your knee. And the reason for that is because uh, the bones around the knee, so the femur and the tibia, are the most common location of fracture in people with spinal cord injury. The way that screening for bone density or risk factors is done uh, in people without spinal cord injury is using an algorithm called FRAX or another algorithm called CAROC and uh, those are designed for people over the age of 40 or over the age of 50 and so people who are younger with a spinal cord injury may still need to have their risk assessed because of their spinal cord injury so maybe making a physician aware that they may still be at risk even though they're at a younger age um, the other thing is the accessibility of DEXA screening so you need to make sure that you go to a bone density lab that has a lift if you cannot transfer onto the scan 
Many people don't really think of fractures as a significant cause of death or disability. Um, so people think, well, they have a fracture and then they had it repaired and then they go home and they recover. But many people don't realize that fractures, like, you know, 20 to 30 percent of people who have a hip fracture will die as a result of the secondary complications associated with that hip fracture. People who have spine fractures are at increased risk of breathing problems and digestive problems and chronic pain. And even wrist fractures can compromise uh, function of your hand. So it's really important to prevent fractures. A common myth uh, in people with spinal cord injury is that they may not need to think about fractures because they're young, but uh, bone loss occurs very rapidly after a spinal cord injury, even in young people, placing them at increased risk of fracture. In people uh, who don't have spinal cord injury, and in people who do have spinal cord injury, we need research to understand how to um, put exercise interventions into practice in the community. So uh, how do we make effective exercise programs available to people and accessible to people? A huge barrier is funding. So exercise can have a number of health benefits, but unfortunately we don't fund exercise services. And the exercise services that are available through community programs are often delivered by people who maybe don't have the skills to tailor exercise for people with disability or people who have uh, falls or who have osteoporosis, or maybe they're uncomfortable in sort of tailoring the exercise to be aligned with the types of exercise that have been shown to be effective. So for example, when we look at the falls literature, the types of exercise that are most effective are balance and functional training, and there's very specific types of exercise programs, but maybe people who are delivering the exercise programs aren't aware of that research and maybe aren't delivering the same types of exercise. So our research looks at how to prevent fractures, either through better risk assessment or through interventions like exercise. And we also work on how do we actually get the research into practice, so doing research on how to do that better. I would say in the research we need to do, in spinal cord injury, we need to do research to better understand how to identify who is at risk, and then also research to figure out how to help clinicians identify who's at risk and also understand what treatments are most effective. Our research lab, the Bone Health and Exercise Science Lab, has a Facebook page. We also have a YouTube channel where we share uh, brief educational videos and you can find me on Twitter.